Welcome to Excel Today with Pastor Afwaka, a weekly broadcast to equip and empower you for all-round excellence in life. Stay tuned and be blessed with this life-transforming teaching. God bless you for being part of today's broadcast. Hello, welcome to Excel Today. I trust you've had a fruitful week. It's always a pleasure and a joy to come your way and share God's word with you. And I believe that you've started the race already. A race has been set before us, whether we know it or not. It is already running. This is January 27th. So you can imagine the first month is already running away. So we have to get running. And I pray that the grace of God will rest upon you to run the race effectively and to win the prize for the race. Let's pray together as we get into God's word today. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your blessing. Thank you for the gift of life and of health. Thank you for the ability to fellowship through this platform. Thank you, Lord, that you are equipping us through your word, which is coming to us with understanding and simplicity, transforming us and equipping us to live a life of all-round excellence. Thank you, Lord, for every viewer at this time of those who may do so thereafter. Thank you, Spirit of God, that the same grace is upon them to run and finish the race that you set before us in this year. We honor you and we give you praise that it is done in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. All right, our text is 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, the New Living Translation. It says, Don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but one gets the prize, so run to win. Don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but one gets the prize, run to win. That is our series title, running to win or run to win run to win we believe that 2024 and the years ahead are ordained for your winning god wants you to win god wants you to live in victory the bible said whosoever is born of god overcomes the world and this is a victory that overcomes the world even our faith once you are born of god once you place your faith in christ you are born a winner the bible said nay in all these things we are more than conquerors. So that is your destiny. That is your place in Christ. You are seated far above principalities and powers. Nothing is supposed to bring you down. You're supposed to be on top. God has ordained you for an ever winning life. How do you live that life? You have to understand how to run the race and be able to win. And we said that if you are going to run the race and not run in vain, if you are going to run the race and win the prize God has ordained for us to win, then we need to know who we are running with. We need to know what to run after. And most importantly, we need to understand the laws of govern the race so we can run and run effectively. And so far, we've looked at who to run with. We started by running with God. We said the first and foremost person we need to run with if you must win the race is to run with God. With God on your side, Everything is possible. With God on your side, you are more than a conqueror. So we need to run with God. That's why you want to be intentional about developing your relationship and staying intimate with God this year. Nothing should disturb your relationship with God. Take your daily time with God in prayer and in the word very seriously because you need him in order to win the race. And then number two, we said we need to run with others. If you are going to run and win, we must run with others. Somebody said, if you want to run fast in life, go alone. But if you want to go far, go with other people. We need others. Sometimes we don't, we, we, we don't see our need of other people in our lives and the various roles they play in our lives. But it's important. I cannot reiterate that point over and over again that you need others. The Bible said, don't think only about yourself, but think about others. So it's important we know how to run with others. Our text has been Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 to 12. We'll read the verse 9 and 10. He says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. There is what you can achieve alone and there is what you can achieve when you learn to team up with others. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth. It's interesting. He says, for if they fall. In other words, if you are working in a team and one falls, the others in the team can help the person up. He says, but woe unto him that is alone when he falleth. I, I like it. He started 
by saying if they fall then he ends up when he fall it so there are times we don't plan to fall but we fall but when you fall there must be someone available to help you when you fall in prayer when you fall or, or you fail in, in the study of a word there must be somebody who would inspire you and challenge you to rise up to fulfill your destiny do you have such a person in your life this year do you have somebody that if you feel like giving up this person will come into your life inspire you and challenge you and tell you there's more for you in christ get up and keep running do you have such a person in your life this year that's what this teaching is about is to challenge you to be become intentional at developing strategic relationships that are designed to bring you into god's full purpose and promise for your life in the year so we looked last week at the priority of relationships the power of relationships the people we must relate with and the protocols that must govern the relationship in order for us to get the most out of the relationship and last week and last two weeks we talked on the priority of relationship last week i talked about three kinds of relationship which are very critical if you must maximize your destiny on the earth these are relationship you must prioritize above every other relationship in your life we talked about relationships those you look up to those who are on the same platform with you and those who look up to you you need these three levels of relationship in your life in order to fulfill destiny today we're focusing on the power of relationship how powerful is relationship having established the priority of relationships we're looking at how powerful are relationship why is it that you must be intentional about running with others about developing relationship that will help you fulfill god's mission and purpose for your life how powerful are relationship let's look at two texts from scripture genesis 2 18 he said and the lord said it is no good that man should be alone I will make him and help me. Now, don't forget Genesis 2. We are still in the book of beginnings. Genesis is where everything began. God created man. He created animals. He created everything. And God is going to speak about his creation. Everything he created, he said it was good. But when he looked at the state of man, he said it is not good that man should be alone. From Genesis 1 all the way until this time, everything God created Everything, this verdict over everything and about everything he had created was that it was good. But when it came to man living alone, the Bible said, God said, it is not good that man should be alone. So it's very important. If God says it is not good, something is not good, then you have to be very intentional about it. It is not good that you are alone. It is not good that you are not connecting with others. It is not good that you are trying to make it all by yourself. You don't see the need in order to link up with other people in order to fulfill God's great purpose and plan for your life. It is not good. Now look at Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. He said, Two are better than one, for they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up the other. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth. Now here, he's taking it to another level. Genesis says, it is not good that man should be alone. Ecclesiastes says, you are cursed if you are alone. Woe unto him that is alone. I, I know you don't want to live a cursed life. So it's a cursed life. A cursed life is a selfish life. A cursed life is a life that is obsessed with self and is not open to connecting with other people. That's a cursed life. And you don't want to live that kind of life. I want you to appreciate today that relationships are very, very powerful. These two references help us to establish the power of relationship. We cannot underestimate the power of relationship. How powerful are relationships? Let me show you something in the book of Acts chapter 4 and verse number 13. Acts 4, 13. The Passion Translation says, The council members were astonished as they witnessed the bold courage of Peter and John, especially when they discovered that they were just ordinary men who had never had religious training. But then they began to understand the effect. Now, Take note of the word. They understand the effect Jesus had had on them simply by spending time with them. That's relationship. Jesus had spent time with them. The Bible says they began to understand when they saw the transformation that had taken place in the life of Peter and the rest of the apostles. They were astonished. 
and then they began to understand the effect of Jesus' relationship with them. They, got, they began to understand the power that Jesus spending time with them had produced in them. Now look at this. This is how their relationship with Christ began. Look at Mark chapter 3 verse 13 to 15. Afterward, Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to himself the men he wanted to be his close companions. The people who must be close to you must be carefully selected. They must not just come into your life randomly. You have to be intentional. The relationship that will advance you, the relationship that will bring the best in you, do not just happen accidentally. They are relationship you intentionally go after. They are relationship you intentionally pursue. They are relationship you consciously build. Those are the relationships that can make a difference in your life. The Bible said Jesus himself intentionally called these people that they will be his close companions. Now continue. He says, so they went up with him. He appointed the 12 whom he named apostles. He wanted them, look at this. He wanted them to be continually at his side as his friends. And so that he could send them out to preach and have authority to heal the sick and to cast out demons. You see how Jesus chose them? He chose them to be continually with him. That is the key, continually with him. And so when Art says that, they were surprised because Jesus had spent time with them. Now, if you look at the ministry of Jesus, it was short. But with the disciples, it was long because most of the time he was with the disciples. Most of the time, after their mission trip, he will still talk to them. They will go on the outreaches. He will come back and will be talking to them. They dine together. They did all kinds of things together. So the people who knew Jesus most were the disciples. The people who were close to Jesus most were the disciples. And the Bible says that three and a half year relationship so imparted them that they saw great transformation in their lives as a result of the relationship. That's what I want you to take home. The principal effect of relationship on our lives is transformation for good or for bad. That's what one thing I want you to take is a quote I want you to appreciate. That the principal effect of relationship on our lives is transformation. That is it. Every relationship in your life transforms you for good or for evil. It, nobody is in a neutral relationship. In the relationship you are in, that is not advancing you, it's stagnating you. In the relationship it would, you have, that is not bringing progress or multiplying your effort or is uh, moving you in a positive direction, is indirectly taking you in a negative direction. Look at a few things scripture has to say concerning our relationships. In the book of Proverbs 13, 20, it said, He that walks with wise men shall be wise, a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Proverbs 27, 17, Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friends. And the psalmist David took it to another level, Psalm 1, verse 1 to 6. He says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners. So you are simply blessed by having good relationships around you. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor seated in the seat of the scornful. By his delight is in the law of his God. And on his law, he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree. Planted by the rivers of water, he shall bring forth his fruit in his season. His leaves also shall not wither. Whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. But the ungodly are not so, but they are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. It's key. We do not have to underestimate the power of relationships. Relationships bring transformation in our lives. That's why I want you to be very meticulous about your relationships this year. Association is one of the most powerful means of transformation in life. If you want to be transformed, then be careful who you associate with. You can hear all the great sermons. You can hear all the, uh, you can read the Bible all you want. But if the relationships in your life don't help you to put the word of God to work, they will not help you to become spiritual. If the relationships in your life don't edify you, they don't challenge you to uh, pursue God at an, a higher level. There's no way you are going to go far with your work with God. So we see that relationships bring transformation. We saw it, one, in the life of the apostles of Christ. The Bible says when they looked at the boldness of Peter, a man who was timid, a man who was hasty with his words, and this man had become patient, he had become so bold. Peter denied Jesus. Even when a little mate, 
came to him and said, you look like one of his disciples. He cursed and denied Jesus. But you remember when transformation came, when power came, and Peter became another man, he stood before the council and told them, listen, we will rather obey God than man. We will not bow down. We are not going to follow your lead anymore. We are going to obey God and we are going to go all out with God. The Bible said when they saw Peter confront them like that, they knew that something had happened and they could only trace it to the relationship, the close relationship he had had with Christ. You have anger problem, stay close with God. You have lust problem, stay close with God. When you stay close to fire, very soon you'll become hot and no fly will settle on you again. This year you will remain close to fire. The fire of the Holy Ghost will keep on burning hotter and hotter on your altar and nothing will be able to rob you of your place in Christ this year in the name of the Lord Jesus. So we see the effect of relationships on the disciples of Jesus. Again, we also see the effect of relationship between the ministry of Apostle Paul and his protege by the name of Timothy. Look at Timothy. Timothy generally was a timid person. So, if you read the letter that was written to him, Paul exhorted him on a number of occasions to let go of timidity, let go of his shyness, and then embrace a new spirit of boldness. Look at it, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6 to 7. He said, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance, that thou stir up the gift of God, which is indeed by the putting on of my hands. Then he tells him, For God had not given us a spirit of fear, the spirit of timidity, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Again, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, he said, Let no man despise thee. Timothy was that leader that could easily be taken advantage of. Timothy was that leader who was not bold enough. But his association with Paul, who could even sometimes confront one of the pillars of the church, Peter, at a certain point when Peter himself was in error, Paul could confront him and tell Peter to his face, listen, what you are doing was wrong. He so empowered Timothy, transformed and challenged Timothy, that later on, Timothy was given instructions such as, correcting elders who were erring without any favor or without any fear. Look at how Timothy's life was turned around. Timothy, timid and shy Timothy, became a bold and courageous bishop through association. There are virtues that we embrace. There are virtues that come into our lives when we relate with people who challenge us and push us from our comfort zone into the zone that God has ordained for us. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 19 to 20. The New International Version said, Do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is brought by two or three witnesses. But those elders who are sinning, you are to reprove before everyone so that others may take warning. Can you imagine that? That pastors who are in error, Timothy, you are the bishop of Ephesus, pastors who are erring, call them to order before the whole people, address them. Let them know that what they are doing is wrong. I mean, that's, that's a lot here. It takes a lot of boldness and courage to be able to do that. Timothy in his old self could not have done that. But Paul's relationship with him imparted him such that now, Timothy could be given this instruction and Paul could trust him to carry it out. Why? Because a great transformation had taken place through relationship. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 2. He said, preach the word. Come on. Be instant in season and out of season. Then he tells him, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Can you imagine that? Preach the word. And in preaching the word, you have to rebuke people. One of the difficulties a pastor or a leader faces is when he has to rebuke people. Rebuke is not something people like. But rebuke is a scriptural injunction. When people are in error, they need to be confronted. They need to be dealt with. They need to be confronted, albeit in love. It is important that a leader learns to do that. And Timothy had to be challenged to do that. But first of all, he had to see Apostle Paul do that again and again so that he could learn from him, pick inspiration from him, and begin to put save into practice in his own life. That is it. That's why I'm saying that the principal effect of relationships on our lives is transformation. And that transformation can be in the positive or in the negative. And I pray that this year, 
Your, your relationships will transform you for the better. They will transform you from being a prayerless Christian to a prayerful Christian. They will transform you from being a Christian who doesn't see fellowship, coming together with believers, fellowshipping in the main church, fellowshipping in small groups. You will begin to have a change of attitude towards it. That this year you will be like David. I was glad when they said unto me, let's go into the house of God. When it's a prayer meeting, you would be conscious at being part of it, whether it's on online or in person. You'll be conscious. When it comes to studying God's word, you'll be conscious. The people you surround yourself with are people who challenge you by their word study to be more detailed in your word study as well. Four ways relationship transform our lives. I'll just start it. I'm not too sure. We can't finish it, but we are going to continue on this tangent, and I'm sure that you are getting blessed. Four ways relationship transforms your life. Four ways. Number one is trust, and I'm going to use four T's to help you. The first one is trust. Association transforms your life by demanding trust from you and building trust in you. Association transforms your life, number one, by demanding trust from you, and number two, by building trust in you. You see, with trust, and we become trusted when we relate with people. That's what happens in relationship. The moment you decide to relate with someone, you have to learn to trust the person. And then you also become trusted. You trust and then you become trusted. So trust is mutual. A lot of people are looking for people who they can trust. But they themselves are not trustworthy. You know where trust starts from? You have to make yourself trustworthy. Then others can trust you. People, we are looking for others we can trust. But the question is, can you be trusted? As you are watching me now, can you be trusted? Have people confided in you and have you betrayed their confidences in the past? Have you been a faithful friend in the past? Or do you intend to be a faithful friend? That's where it starts from. Don't go looking for a faithful friend. Start by becoming a faithful friend. That's where true transformation begins. You cannot change people, but you can change yourself. And when you change yourself, you would see the changes other people have made. And then you can bond over them as well. So relationship brings intimacy. Intimacy demands trust. Anybody you relate with, you become vulnerable to the person. That's why you need to relate with people you can trust. Look at what Jesus said. He started, and I'm using all of these things. It's coming from Jesus' relationship with the disciples. That's where my key points are coming from. The first thing we see with his relationship with the disciples, they did not, Jesus did not just begin telling them everything. They couldn't have taken it. He, start, he took his time. It is wrong to meet somebody today and open up your whole life to the person. What happened to you 10 years ago? What happened to you 5 years ago? What happened to you last month? What happened? Everything about your life. Some people are just too loose with their mouth. They meet you and within 30 minutes, you know everything about them. That is a risk. This is somebody you can confide in. This is somebody you don't know. You just started a relationship and are telling the person everything about yourself. No, that's the wrong way to go. Look at what Jesus said. John 15, 15. Now, John from John 15, 15, Jesus was getting ready to go. You know, John 14, he began to tell them, don't be troubled. John, John 16 began to tell them, don't be worried. In my father's house are many mansions. And they were worried. He was getting ready to go. He said, I will send the comforter. So this, he's in transition now. He's been with them three and a half years. He's getting ready to bring his ministry to an end. And this is the time he begins to let them see how he's come to trust them. Look at this. John 15, 15. I no longer call you slaves. So the relationship is changing now. Because a master does not confide in his slaves. Now you are my friend since I have told you everything the father told me. That's the relationship. They started as slaves. They started as servants. But the relationship has graduated. And your relationship with people must graduate. You can start people as ordinary, normal acquaintances. But as you get to know them, as you build trust, the relationship must grow. Jesus said, I call you no longer servant. And the reason why the relationship has changed is because now I can trust you. You've proven yourself to be trustworthy. I can trust you. And so I'm telling you that now you are my friends because you can be trusted. You have to understand that friendship is built on trust. If people share their deep fears with you, their concerns with you, their secrets, things they are not able to express to any mortal apart from God, and then they have the courage to tell you, 
if you betray them, you have said something that is very dear to them and it will be very difficult for them to come back to you again. Look at Proverbs 27 verse 6. It says, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Your friends should be faithful enough to tell you when you are in the error. That is a true friend. That's a person you can trust. If you are going wrong and they can't tell you, then they are not a friend. The Bible says people, your enemies, when they kiss you, are better than a friend who cannot tell you the truth. If you have too many enemies who give you kisses, but you have one friend who can't tell you the truth, those enemies are better. Because a friend who can't tell you the truth that will bring transformation into your life is as worse as an enemy. Look at Proverbs eleven thirteen. He said, a tale bearer reveals secrets, but he who is a faithful spirit, he who is of a faithful spirit, concealeth a matter. That's a faithful person. Proverbs 25, 19. Confidence in an unfaithful man in a time of trouble is like a bad tooth and a foot out of joint. The New Living Translation puts it this way. Putting confidence in an unreliable person in times of trouble is like sewing with a broken tooth or walking on a lame foot can you imagine when you there, there's a toothache you you are not able to chew and the bible says when you put confidence in an unfaithful person that is how your lot is like may that not be your testimony so you have to what proverbs is simply telling you is that you have to be careful those whom you choose to trust be careful this year last year you made some negative choices you trusted certain people and they betrayed you and this year you have started running on the same course that cannot be as you are hearing me now have the courage to change course have the boldness to change direction because you need it in order to secure your interests when you trust an unfaithful person it is very risky so be careful whom you trust and then you also need to be careful when you are trusted so be careful whom you trust and be careful also when you are trusted. Look at this, Proverbs chapter 20 verse 19 as I close. He said, he who goes about as a tale bearer reveals secrets. Therefore, do not associate with him who flatters with his lips. The Bible says there are people you should not associate with. Those who are tail bearers, those who can keep their mouth shut, those you trust and they will betray your confidences. The Bible says don't associate with them. You just saw it yourself. When you are trusted, you have to be very careful because you see, when you are trusted and you betray the trust, you will not be uh, absorbed of the consequences of the same. You remember, David trusted Ahitophel. And he confided in Ahitophel. Ahitophel betrayed the trust. Do you know what happened? Ahitophel ended up hanging himself. The one he betrayed, he lived. The one who betrayed him, hanged himself. It's the same thing. Jesus trusted the man Judas. Made him the finance minister of their ministry. Made him the chief accountant of the ministry. This man went and sold the destiny of Jesus. He sold him. For 30 pieces of silver. Matthew chapter 26 verse 14 to 16. And when he did that. He also. Jesus was supposed to die and save Judas also. But unfortunately. Judas died before Christ. And so he missed it. Can you imagine that? He went to hang himself. Even before Jesus would go to the cross. Why? Because he betrayed confidences. I pray that this year. You will be a trusted friend. And I pray that this year. The spirit of God will guide you. That you will be, he will guide you to people you can trust as you learn to become trustworthy. So we say that relationship bring transformation because number one, it demands trust from you, and then number two, it builds trust in you. You are blessed. Thank you so much for joining our broadcast today. I look forward to having you join me same time next week as we continue on the transformational power of relationship. God richly bless you till I see you same time next week. Maximize the grace of God and remain blessed. It's great having you to be part of today's broadcast. Join us same time next week Saturday on the same channel for another insightful moment on Excel Today with Pastor Afwafa. You are gladly invited to fellowship with the Embassy of Life Chapel family for our good news services on Sunday across our respective branches for a life-changing experience. You can also be part of the service online on this same channel. Remain blessed and have a grace-filled day.